Here with us today on This Week with Sabir, sharing his wealth of knowledge on building communities, driving innovation, and conquering your goals. Oh, and did we mention he's also a published author with his book, Decide and Conquer, which we will be discussing plenty today, uh, available on Amazon and uh, Bar Barnes & Noble. And this is what the book looks like. Definitely head over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever amazing books are sold. Definitely pick this up. Uh, that's what the book looks like. David? Welcome to the show. So excited to be here and thank you for the opportunity. So before we get started, I always ask uh, uh, my guests to introduce their kind of your back, their background. So if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your background in tech and media. Sure. Here you go. So I was an early employee at a company called DoubleClick, which anyone who is probably 40 and above certainly knows. It was the internet company, certainly in New York, in the late 1990s. I started consulting there in 1998, working wow. there in 99, saw the internet bubble go up like crazy. Our stock went from you know 10 to 200. And then, of course, in 2000, saw the crash of it would go from 200 you know, down to like five. So I started my career. Uh, at DoubleClick, I'd always been in tech for a while. Then I t did a series of kind of executive positions at other digital um, and tech companies, One Hundred Flowers. I was an executive in that company, another company called Everyday Health, which is similar to WebMD. Uh, and then I became president of a company called Seeking Alpha, uh, which is a okay. financial publisher. Then I became the CEO of Investopedia. Many people know Investopedia as the world's largest financial education site. The CEO there for about four years, tripled the company's revenue. Um, sold the company, and then Adam Newman and WeWork came a knocking and said, "Hey, um, we want to hire you as the first outside CEO of Meetup." And I said, "Oh, I love Meetup. Meetup is—I've been going to Meetup events for a decade. It builds community. Sign me up." Twenty-seven interviews later, with the entire <laughs> WeWork team and Meetup team, I ended up um, getting the offer, and I've been the CEO of Meetup for. Uh, uh, about four and a quarter years at this point, and hopefully for many years to come. In addition to that, I'm also a professor at Columbia. I teach entrepreneurship and strategy and have a podcast as well called Keep Connected. That's my background. Yeah, I mean, I, I started uh, teaching at Queens College as an ad adjunct professor. I'm an alumni of Queens College here. So uh, I, I teach uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and digital commerce entrepreneurship. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We should, we should, we should, um, we should share syllabus, syllabi. Because um, and, and guest and guest awesome lecture people. in each other's classes. I, I'm in. Definitely. I'm in. Let's, let's awesome. try it. Uh, so tell me about kind of your vision uh, for the platform, for the Meetup platform as you became. Uh, what was your vision when you started with uh, as the CEO of uh, Meetup? Yeah. So Meetup has been around for a long time. And obviously, there's good and bad to a company that's been around for a long time. In fact, just last year, we celebrated our 20th anniversary. The, the good is that our brand is extremely well known. Um, we have 60 million users of Meetup in 200 different countries um, and 260,000 different groups. And we're very big. That's the good. The bad is that there was a lot of tech debt and the technology had kind of strung together with bubble gum and shoelaces. <laughs> and there's just lots of suboptimal ways in which the company was set up. So, and, and what th that did is it disenabled our ability to be able to uh, make changes and iterate on the product, but make one change here and we break 10 things at somewhere else, which is a problem. So my first thing that really we did is we focused on how do we rebuild the entire infrastructure so that we could iterate fast, so we could change things quickly and we could make a much better experience. That's kind of very foundational. And then besides that, um, another big area of focus was um, there were a lot of different kind of pet projects that the CEO was running. And it's very dangerous to have all these pet products. We said, like, let's just focus on our core business. How do we connect people? How do we end the loneliness epidemic? What do we do to get more people to create meetup events and attend meetup events and just stick to kind of our core as opposed to trying to like branch out into all these other kind of random apps and other things? So those were my kind of my two primary areas of focus. And, uh, you know, pandemic put a little wrench in, uh, you know, in challenges for meetup, which we can talk about later. Um, and uh, but now this, I mean, since we launched, it's now is now you know January, and the beginning of the year because of New Year's resolutions has been just like amazing for us. We're just like up in everything, uh, and it's because I think what people say is they say I have a resolution to meet more friends, meet up. 
I have resolution to learn more um, about technology, meetup. I have a resolution to go to support groups, meetup. I have a resolution to move to a new city, meetup can help you meet new people. So it's like, we're, we're just seeing a lot of different groups because of New Year's resolutions springing up. So it's nice. So besides the meetup, you know, um, you're a professor, like you said, at Columbia University, right? And mm -hmm. you have your podcast, Keep Connected. Having been run, running this show for now past three years, this is my fourth year now, it's a lot of work. And I also teach, which is a lot of, a ton of work also by yeah. itself, you know, yeah. and to be a CEO of Meetup. So what what kinds of things uh, do you do at, as a professor at, at Columbia University? Are you part-time there or full-time? Um, um, I'm an adjunct professor. So adjunct, okay. I teach sometimes in fall and spring and sometimes one time. So I've taught I think eight or nine semesters so far. Wow. Um, wow. So I, I absolutely love it. I have you, seven, you, you I must love class. teaching. <laughs> yeah. I have 70 students in the class. Wow. Um, I learned so much from them, you know, because many of them are planning on becoming entrepreneurs. I'm actually on the board of like five different students who have built successful businesses, whether it's for profit or nonprofit. So I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, and, you know, I just love kind of the youthful enthusiasm of, of how to kind of build a business. And sometimes I encourage people not to become entrepreneurs in entrepreneurship class and understand how challenging it is. And if they do, then to understand kind of what the, what the big challenges are and to learn lean startup methodology is kind of a very big part of kind of the class as well. Yeah, just don't assume that magically VC funding comes on day zero. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no. Most of the time it doesn't. Yeah, we could do a whole show on all the myths that we can bust yeah. when you're an entre starting entrepreneur and you, which maybe you watch a lot of fantasy on, on CNBC and other places. Yes. It is it is not like Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so you're also a published author with your book and which we will dive into quite a quite a quite a lot. Sure. What inspired you? And, and can you tell us a little bit about the, about the book? Yeah, of course. So. I've always been obsessed with decision making because I found that what separates happy people from less happy people, oftentimes successful people in business or in life from less quote unquote successful people, whatever success means, because it means different things to different people and it should, is the ability to make decisions generally and to make the right decisions. So I've been obsessed with it for a long time. I've read countless you know, books on the topic, et cetera. And, but, and I've always, because I'm a professor, I've always loved teaching others. The challenge is when you're a professor, you teach others, you have 70 students in your class, great. But if I want a, a way to positively influence as many people as I can, then writing a book could have an even greater positive influence than just teaching a class. So but the problem was, I didn't want to re write like a boring book with like just principles and like principle one, principle seven, principle eight, like that's just boring. The best books are stories. And just crazy stories and roller coaster insane experiences and then extracting learnings from those crazy experiences but making something a real page turner i didn't really have enough life crazy experiences that i thought would be entertaining enough but then i was a part of we work and we work was such an insane environment for anyone who's watched the show we crashed or if anyone who's read the book um, billion dollar loser or the cult of we so many crazy things happened while i was at we work that the stories lent themselves really well towards helping to teach a set of decision-making principles and have it be like a real page turner. Um, and that was the goal of the book to get people like to have like really engaged, engaged kind of writing and storytelling, but to extract really important principles in the process. So I literally wrote the book. I am not kidding. In two months, I just like during the wow. pandemic, just started writing, wrote the whole thing out sent it to one publisher, HarperCollins. Normally I have to send to lots of different publishers and find book agents and have, and have an agent or anything like that. And they loved it. And they're like, we want to publish this. I was like, great. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, given the fact, now let's go dig into some of the, uh, some of the principles, but I want to, I want to throw a little bit of a wrench because great. the world has thrown wrenches at us and that's kind of the unpredictable nature of the world we live in, everything mm -hmm. from the pandemic to supply chain issues to uh, wars or wars that could lead to World War Three, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, all sorts of things. I mean, the recession, inflation. You, there's a lot of unpredictability, especially where 
we're packing a punch right now. Yes. So when you're thinking about uh, decide and conquer, all of the things that I just mentioned impacts uh, your business, impacts you as an entrepreneur and as mm-hmm. a business. So from decide and conquer's principles, uh, what are your thoughts on that? If you could just uh, just tell tell me how how you conquer that. Yeah, let's. Can we take the example of of uh, the pandemic? Use that and then just take off. Sounds from there? great. Yeah. Let's okay. Go. So when the pandemic hit and we saw it hitting in China, of course, in like February of 2020, we saw overnight, boom, late February, every single event get canceled overnight in China, overnight, and we're like. Now, uh, what, what's going on here? There's been pandemics in the past in, in Asia, you know, with SARS and other things. It hasn't necessarily influenced New York or the U.S., excuse me. And even though we're in 200 countries, it was it was a, not a big worry. Then we start seeing every event get canceled in Italy, northern Italy specifically. We're like, what's happening here? And then in Europe, and then, of course, very quickly in, in the U.S., in fact, the, the second case of covid that Mount Sinai Hospital had, which is a big hospital in New York, was a meetup employee. So it really happened very quickly for meetup. And um, we quickly got all employees together. Once we started seeing our business just nosedive overnight, all of our events were canceled. Like we're called meetup. What does meetup do when you can't meet up in person? We got together as a group and we said, what is our mission? And this gets to your answer in terms of the principles. What is our mission? Is our mission about IRL in real life, getting together in person? Or is our mission about connecting and keeping people connected? Which is our mission? So one of the key decision-making principles that I talk a lot about in the book is to make sure that you understand what your true mission is when you're making a decision. And if you're gonna pivot, there's a concept when you're pivoting, you keep your heel planted and you you move your foot. It's not your wholesale moving something. So you're keeping something planted. What should be planted is your mission. When you're making a decision, make sure that you understand what your mission is as a company or as an individual. And you can change your strategy, change your direction, but you don't want to change your mission. Because if you do, you're, you're, you're going to be sunk because that's what you stand for. So our mission was about not in person. Our mission was about connecting. And we said, the world needs to meet up even more. We took, we made that decision very quickly very quickly. Another principle in the book is the importance of speed in decision making. And um, we launched an MVP, a minimum viable product within three days that allowed for online virtual meetups. In our 18 year history up to that point, Sabir, we prohibited all groups that were only virtual events. Prohibited it. We lost tens of millions of dollars by prohibiting it. But we said, our goal is our mission. We're going to focus on helping keep people connected, and we and we we launched a, kind of an MVP very fast, and kind of that really helped to save Meetup. We're now kind of bigger than we were beforehand. The number of virtual events that we've had, we've had over five million virtual events wow. at Meetup, which is kind of amazing. And uh, the pandemic was hard, but we're going to mirror much stronger because of it. Definitely. So one of the th- things you mentioned there, I'm going to pick on it a little bit. Right. Uh, but kind of, kind of, because it kind of uh, reminded me of certain uh, platitudes. Besides being fast, right? Certain pl- platitudes like "nice guys finish last." I mm-hmm. mean, <laughs> you know, platitudes like that. Mm-hmm. And, and you talk about avoiding them. Uh, so, well, w- w- what are your? C- can you give me? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, great. So, one of the principles that I talk about in the book, and there's there's ten in total, is the importance of being kind when making a decision and understanding that every decision you make, you could do it in a way like, let's say you have to make layoffs, which we did at Meetup. And I can talk about that later. You can make it in a kind way, or you can make it in a, you know, an unkind way, which is the way a lot of companies do layoffs. Look at Elon Musk, for example. But there's also a big difference between being kind and being nice. And here's the thing. It's important as leaders for us to be kind, not necessarily to be nice. So what I mean by that is it's not nice to fire someone, but it could be the kindest thing you're doing for a person because they need to move on. It may not be nice to tell someone what you're working on is not that valuable. We need to change what you're working on, but it's kind to do that. So kindness in decision making is so incredibly important and understand the difference. Don't be an asshole. Be kind. 
but sometimes you can't necessarily be nice, but find ways to be kind. And there's a difference between the two. Yeah. Or, or, or kind of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I would you, say, are, you and I are both from New York. You know, you know, you know what that means. I do. I do. I do. I would say is, uh, I would say be kind, be kind. <laughs> Good things about totally. I mean, uh, one one of the hats. I mean, I love wearing hats. This one says "Strictly Business." I have another hat. Yeah. It's not close by. It says "Stay Human." I got oh, it in yeah. Bali. Uh, it's it's a phenomenal. Uh, wherever I go, everybody remembers that I'm the guy who was wearing that hat. Nobody else I wears it. it. You know, "Stay Human." You know, I love it's it. not it's mine. Really... It's not not my tagline. Somebody else's. I bought the hat. You know, in Bali. And we, we we talked earlier that I was in Bali recently, actually leading a leadership workshop. Um, related, related to the book because someone read the book in, in Jakarta and said like, hey, fly out to Bali and teach us more about decision making. That was crazy fun. But like you said, being human, at the end of the day, we're put on this earth to try to make the world a better place. And it's not to make a ton of money for ourselves, not to be selfish, but, but being human is good business. Uh, people remember how you treat them. Our reputations, I've been working now for 25 years. And like people, people remember my reputation from when I was a double click 25 years ago or wherever I was 20 years ago. And, and people check up on you, people back channel you, people ask references around you. And if you don't do it because it's the right thing to do, which is the best reason to do it, first of all, but if you're not doing it for that reason, do it because it's just good for yourself, good for your business, good for your career to always remember to be human. So I love that, Sabir. Yeah, one of the things um, I'm sure that you know who Gary V is, Gary Vaynerchuk. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he always talks about um, he's building a honey empire, you mm. know. So it's always about honey. It's about being kind and empathetic and so on. Mm. And then empire. Yes, we are in the business of actually building a business. So it's not yeah. like this is not a charitable thing we're doing, you know. Yeah. So you can, that's the that's the phrase, phraseology he uses. You know? I love that. I love it. And the, the analogy of honey is a great one, actually, because. The whole idea of honey is that it, it causes people to want to stick to you, right? And 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 people are excited and they stick and you retain employees better, you retain, you retain clients better, you know, if you're honest and you have high integrity. So it's it's a great analogy. Uh, what about um, ca- taking, you know, like calculated risk taking? Uh, sure. Because uh, when you're making those kind of decisions, obviously it has to be a calculated risk. You're doing it every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from a, from the principal standpoint, how can individuals and in our organizations use that to make better decisions? Yeah, great. So one of the biggest p- things around risk taking that people don't realize is that, that there's oftentimes a greater risk in not making a decision than in making the wrong decision even. So there's a great quote by Theodore uh, Roosevelt, our ex-president who said, the best decisions are great decisions, the next best decisions are bad decisions, the worst decision is no decision. And I share that because when people oftentimes think about risks, they think, "Uh uh-oh, if I make this decision, it could be really risky. And I don't wanna do that because I don't wanna add more risk. What they don't realize is that oftentimes by not making a decision, it could even be riskier. So for example, when the pandemic hit, We could have decided not to make any decision regarding whether to allow for virtual events and virtual groups. That would have been much more risky than making the decision to start allowing for that. So I would say that a good way to mitigate risks is not not to make a decision, but it's to make a decision quickly, make a decision speedily, learn from that decision, get data around that decision, and then iterate on the decision. You know, people talk about like, minimum viable products, I think a very important thing to think about is what's your MVD? What's your minimum viable decision? How can I make a decision as quickly, as speedily as possible to actually mitigate risks? So with calculated uh, risk taking, one of the challenges is analysis paralysis, right? Some people get stuck in that, that, and that's one one of the things that could potentially lead to uh, indecision, right? Yes. They're paralyzed because it's too exactly. much, either too much information, too much data, or too many variables, and they cannot, they, they're just frozen in place, and they cannot decide what to, what to do. I mean, if you have an organization behind you, it's one thing, but if you are an entrepreneur founder in the early stages, 
that your team might be just you and maybe your wife or your husband, you know? Uh, so what, what are your thoughts on that? How do you navigate yeah. that? I mean, I think it goes to understanding what the goal of a startup is. As um, Eric Rice writes in Lean Startup, the goal of a startup is learning, full stop. The goal of an entrepreneur is learning. You teach entrepreneurships at OI. The only way to learn is to get something out to market and to get feedback on that. So if you anchor your, your, your decision in what your goal is, you will end up making a better decision. So for example, for that person analysis paralysis and doesn't want to launch something, well, the goal is to, if the goal is to learn, you're not going to learn by just doing analysis. You're not going to learn by having fear. You're going to learn by getting it out there. You're going to learn by making mistakes. You're going to learn by getting customer feedback and by positioning everything as maximizing learning. That's how you could overcome that fear. And as long as people understand maximizing learning is the goal, as speedily as you can, good things will happen. Uh, so how do you take into account, because uh, whenever you make a decision, uh, whether you're an entrepreneur or a CEO of Meetup, mm -hmm. there always are stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. And then you also have your community. You're, mm -hmm. You know, you, the impact of your decision on uh, a physical connection versus virtual connection. And and also your stakeholders go like, are you out of your mind? Do you want to go virtual? Right. What is that? Yeah. You know, you, you know? we had most of our employees said exactly that. So so I think one of the most important things when making a decision, again, I talk about this in the book quite a bit, is the importance of having people who disagree with you and surrounding yourself by disagree disagreement. Like the famous analogy again of another American president, uh, Abraham Lincoln where he, there's a famous, there's a great book called Team of Rivals. He surrounded himself by people who disagreed with him on a frequent basis. And when you surround yourself by people who disagree severe, what it does is, is that, it, it, so for example, if I am very extroverted, I'm gonna surround myself with someone who disagrees and gonna take a more thoughtful approach to uh, a particular problem or, or metric. So if I am someone, I'll give you a very concrete example right now, which is um, I tend to focus really heavily on revenue growth. Mm -hmm. I am purposely going to hire people on my team who are gonna be far, far, far more focused on the customer experience, on the product experience, and we're gonna disagree. We're gonna disagree around priorities. And they're going to say to me, no, we need to prioritize product features to make for a better experience. And I'm going to say, no, we need to, just, we need to prioritize growing revenue because that's what our, our shareholders and board is, is looking for. Very concrete example of, of something that happens in every single executive team all the time. At the end of the day, we end up making a better decision in terms of strategy and prioritization as a company because of the fact, in, in terms of what we prioritize, because I have people on the team who are disagreeing with me. And that's kind of one example of kind of, of disagreement, but we have tons of examples of disagreeing. The way that we disagree oftentimes as well is what we do is we will create a Google doc for all key decisions. We will then ask the executive team members to share their perspectives in the Google doc prior to a meeting. And then we have disagreement happening. You know, we create a forum and a process around disagreement so that we're, we're inviting disagreement. We're saying like the more that you could disagree, the better. And by building those processes in, um, it, it, it really creates the culture of disagreement, which is so important to decision-making. Yeah, I mean, um, one, one of the things uh, you're talking about disagreements. So you and I have faced fan clubs and hate clubs, yes. right? You know, every decision you make, you have a fan club of, of folks that love you. And then at the same time, you have a hate club, haters club that hate that decision. How do you how do you balance those two things? OK, let me give you a, a very concrete example right now of something we recently rolled out. So we've had it meet up uh, a number of different ways that our organizers and members can communicate with each other. We've had message boards which is old school, of course. We have event comments. People can comment on different, on different events. But what we didn't have, which is what everyone has, is the ability to chat, like on our app,
like it, for example, let's say you're you, everyone here has used Airbnb. So if you want to chat with your host, they have great chat functionality, back and forth chat, group chats, individual chats, those things. So we said, we got to get with the times. We cannot have like all these old school communication vehicles. We need to build event chat into our product because people aren't actually asking for it, but we know that they should, that it's, it will help. It will help. But we've had people in the meetup platform for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years that are used to our current communication tools. We scrapped one of the, a couple of the communication tools, shut it down and, and, and then create a new communication tool called event chat where people can chat. The problem was we upset a lot of our historic organizers who are used to using certain features that we had in the past that we, that we got rid of. So what did we do? We listened to the feedback and we decided we we're going to actually going to put those features back into event chat and reprioritize everything to make sure that those older features we put into kind of the new product. And all of that is about listening, getting the feedback. We, we track every piece of feedback that we get. We get thousands of feedback, literally thousands of email messages kind of a week, maybe even a day for that matter. And we track everything by theme. And then we prioritize all of our product features and our, and, and our roadmap based on kind of volume of feedback so the 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 it's not about listening to one person this is the problem severe who feels very very strongly and is very very angry that we can't listen to because too often the 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 very vocal minority ends up being the basis for who how you prioritize a product feature or decision and you can't instead we look at it from a quantitative perspective where is there the greatest pain points listed and that is the basis for it so we don't listen to the vocal minority unless that vocal minority becomes a more you know greater majority in which case we then will listen to them so it's very quantitative based um and we don't just let the angry people kind of you know uh, be in charge yeah I, you kind of reminded me of uh, uh jason freed uh with base camp mm -hmm. i mean he was notorious for saying no uh to you're talking about the minority, but to major clients, when they said, can you add these kind of features? Our teams yes. could use it on Basecamp. No. Right. No. It's so dangerous. And it happens with B2B <laughs> all the time. In B2B businesses, so you have a big client. And we have actually Google's a client, AWS is a client, Microsoft. We have lots of companies that are clients. But B2B businesses are notorious for getting like very specific requests for like a specific feature that are just help their company. And like, you just gotta like be really careful not to do that. It has to be, everything needs to be data driven and understand like literally, I just had a meeting right before this where it's our, it's our customer review meeting, which we do once a, mo once a month. And it's just a sorting of highest to lowest preponderance of feedback. And it's like green, yellow, red. And we want lots of greens on the top, meaning we're taking action on those or we've already taken action and lots of reds on the bottom. I mean, we're listening. But we're not taking action yet. You know, so as an author, I, I, I would say that, you know, you uh, there are certain things that you you would write in your book, right? There are principles that initially it, the intent was professional, right? For my work, for meetup and so on. But there's always, it just, that professional life bleeds into your personal life. Yes. So how do those 44 <laughs> principles, right, uh, you know, impact your personal life? How do you utilize them in your personal life? Or, or or did it go the other way around? Meaning that I mean, they were the answer is it goes both ways. It goes both ways. So one of the principles in the book is is never have decision making surprises. Never surprise your loved ones, your friends. Never surprise your employees. Never surprise your board. And 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 so I took a work principle. So a work principle is is basically be surprised only about being surprised. Meaning. Surprises happen all the time, and your job is to not surprise the people around you. So, for example, if um, and this has happened, if we made we needed to do a layoff layoff. This is a while ago. We haven't done one in over three years, thank God. Um, but when we had to do a layoff prior to that time, I didn't want people to be surprised. Now we didn't say, "Guess what? Layoffs are coming," because that would freak everyone out. But instead, we were very open about our financials. 
Under WeWork, we were losing $18 million a year. $18 million wow. a year. The company lost over $40 million prior to my joining in the first year. And it was just not sustainable. We're now making $5 million a year. And what we did is we shared our financials with the whole company. And, and by doing so, when people saw, oh my God, I can't believe how much money the company's losing. When we did have to do a layoff, no one was surprised because of the fact that they had a lot of knowledge and information that they knew this is not sustainable, the situation that we're in. Now, take that principle that's professional and now apply it to the person, personal. So how do you make sure not to surprise your wife about something that's important to you? <laughs> no, you no, one sure person you don't want to surprise. You do not all. want to surprise Never. your wife or your significant other. How yeah. do you not want to surprise your children with things that are important? Like if you're planning on moving, um, then you know you don't just like one day wake up and say, guess what? We're moving tomorrow. Like that's that's traumatic. So how do you prep that? How do you pre-communicate? How do you share some of the challenges that there might be you might be facing in a community so that people can understand why you ultimately make that decision? Now, um, with every decision, you you have the the results, right? You you succeed, or what I like calling, I, I don't want to use the word failure. What I do in my work and for all my clients is ter- test, learn, and optimize. Yeah, that's beautiful. that's the cycle. Yeah, you either win or you learn. Learn. Yeah, you either we will we will give give our best approach to what we are trying to do: marketing experiment, Google ads, Facebook ads, doesn't matter, right? Uh, we're testing it. Either you know we know that these things succeed, and these are the other experiments we will set up, and we'll learn from it. Maybe our budget is not right. Maybe the creative is not right. Maybe the ad copy is not right. The audience was off. Maybe we need to tweak the audience, narrow it down, create a, a different kind of option. Mm-hmm. That's what you need to be in forever loop like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but when that's a very specific, it's very quantitative. Some of it could be qualitative because of creative, but how do you put that into from a print, from, from the, uh, you know, from a decide and conquer principles, how do you put that into your decision making that, uh, you know, w- whether it's a runaway success or now you have to learn something from it? How, how do you go through that? And can you give that with, with uh, some examples? Yeah, sure. So a few weeks ago, it's not in the book, but but I'll apply a principle. A few weeks ago, we launched something called Meetup Plus. It has to have a plus because that's what everyone's doing these days, right? And what Meetup Plus is, it's a feature for all of our meetup members, we have 60 million members, to get additional capabilities. They don't see any ads. They could skip the line and um, and not be on wait lists. There's a whole bunch of different features that Meetup Plus members can get. And it, it was it was a big question. It was a question of whether we should launch this or not launch it. And there was all this debate that was happening. And again, you know, the principle of being speedy, like we mentioned earlier, is, is and learning is up ultimately the priority. So we said, we don't know if it's going to succeed or fail. Let's just do what's called a dry test. I love dry tests. What a dry test is, essentially no tech work. We pretended like we had something called Meetup Live. We didn't have it yet. Now we do this a few months ago. And we put all these calls to action about whether or not they'd be interested in this feature of of Meetup Plus, that feature of Meetup Plus, whatever it was. And then when they got to the, they clicked on, yes, I want to buy. After they after they bought it, they thought they bought it. We said, well, we haven't rolled it out yet. The reason why we did that is because rather than having opinions about like, does this make sense? Is it going to be successful? How big can this really be? All these opinions don't mean anything. They're not grounded in data. So we then looked at what the click-through rate was, what the conversion rate was, and we're able to use those as a basis for putting up financial model together of how big this business can actually be. Once we looked at the data and we said, whoa, look at the percentage of people that are buying this or thinking that they're buying something. And, and what if that, what, you know, and, and we keep the same rates. So it's not what people say that matters. It's what people do. It's actual actions. So when making a decision, try to find the path towards seeing people's actions and what they do because what people say and what they do like you run a survey who cares what they say it could be totally different things hey, you actually reminded me of uh, a, a question like do you recycle 
right? If you ask people, 100% of people will say, yes, I exactly. recycle. But when you put a camera uh, and hit a hidden camera to see on garbage day, to see, do they separate out their recycling from the trash? You find out that there's a number. There's a number. Yeah. It's not 100%. 100. Yeah, it's yeah. probably 50, 55%, something. something like that, you know? Yeah, and Severe, I love I love that one. The other one I love is how like 80% of drivers say they're above average drivers. Like, that's not possible. So, you know, what people say and what people actually do really does matter. And, you know, people will ask the survey, would you buy this? Who cares if you would buy it? Like, did you buy this or not? That's what actually matters. Yeah. Actually, there was a, an excellent book I read many years ago uh, by Paco Underhill, Why We Buy. Mm. I don't know if you if you read that book. Very famous uh, book, sure. Very famous book. Really, really fun book to read. And he talks about, this is about old school retail, about, uh, you know, when somebody walks into a retail or walks mm -hmm. by the retail, what do they do? The best way to know, don't ask the cashier, don't ask the customers, don't survey them. Set up cameras. Um, and analyze heat map and analyze where they're going, where there are dead zones and stuff. And that's what you learn from it. Yes. Uh, if you want to know what promo works, do a trial run, <laughs> you know, run, run, run it for Christmas in July to see if it's going to work for your Black Friday sale, you know, do that. And that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, I had read that when I was much younger. I think maybe I was in my 20s when I read that book. It's an old book. I think it's available on Amazon. It's a fabulous oh, yeah. book. Yeah, absolutely. You know? It's it's a great it's a really great book and, and and again it's like anything else like we we hire um, people and watch them play with our website watch them play with our app and just see what they're doing just literally watch what they're doing don't ask them to do anything just like create an event attend an event browse search whatever just watch and you're like and someone's getting stuck on something someone's waiting for a while just watch how people are interacting with your product. And good things will happen. And then shut up and then just and just learn and listen. Yeah, it's not opinion. It's not one person's not opinion. Opinion. That's the yeah. other yeah. people I mean, it's, they're so smart. Well, the smartest thing to do is is basically follow the data. That's it. Full stop. That's it. Yeah. I mean, one one of the things that almost every client says to me, right? Uh, because I help them scale their business, you know. Mm -hmm. They they go like, So what do you think? You know, what do we need to do? I, I don't know. You, you gave birth to this company. You've been running it for 30 years. You just spoke to me for 30 minutes. You think I should have a specific opinion about that? I need to look under the hood and see what's going on, you know? Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great example of just data-driven decision-making needs to kind of trump anything else. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, actually, I had... Um, now let's move to from the individual, right? You as a CEO because you're not running Meetup by yourself. You have an organization yeah, around you. 200 employees, exactly. Yep. Uh, I know, David, that you get blamed at the end of the day for everything. That, you know, that, that's, yes, should. <laughs> that's the job of the CEO. But you have your SVPs, you have your EVPs, you know, they, they, you, have, uh, you, have, you have your teams, you have your organizations. Mm -hmm. How can you help? Because one of the responsibilities of the CEO or the leader at the top, the founder, mm -hmm. is to actually inspire people to, mm -hmm. So that they can make you, you, you groom them to become better leaders, you know. Mm -hmm. So from your principles, which ones fall into that kind of a uh, you know grooming, grooming and and guiding and coaching uh, your leadership? Yeah, great. So in the book, I talk a lot about the concept of what's called the upside down organizational chart, which essentially means that I'm at the bottom of the chart as a CEO. And my executive team is at the bottom level and the most junior people are at the top. My job as a CEO is one thing, support and enable the success of the people on my team. The job of my team, my CFO, my our, our VP of growth, et cetera, their job is to support and enable the success, the success of the people on their teams. So if you see your role as not I'm the driver and I'm the person who's in charge, it's my job is to enable you to be as successful as possible. And if every one of my executives are as successful as possible, guess what? As CEO, I'm going to be successful. I don't need to do anything except for make sure that everyone on my team is as successful as possible. So one of the things I try to do is in our my one-on-ones with every one of my team, I end a one-on-one and say, what could I do to help you make you more successful? Like, oh, yeah, actually you could do X, Y, Z. So again, it's finding a way to be kind, finding a way to be supportive, finding a way to 
you know, enable people to succeed. That's the role of a leader. And that's the role of an executive team. And if everyone is doing that, then the company will succeed. Well, one of the earlier things that we uh, talked about is that uh, uh, decide and conquer is not a framework, right? It's a it's principles, right? Yes. So because the thing is, typically with frameworks, it tends to be very rigid, right? right. Uh, either you fall into the framework or you have to you have to just use the framework, right? And and just suffer through it, you know. Versus you call uh, decide and conquer, you you call it principles. It's not it's not framework. How is adaptability and and flexibility in that? Right. If if it's forty four, do do I abide by forty four or am I, uh, you know, it, it, or are there industries do you believe that is just not it's not going to work for them? Yeah, yeah it's a, a paramount importance. I'll give you a very concrete example. So one of the most common decision making frameworks. It's called the Eisenhower matrix. I don't know if you ever heard familiar. of it. Very familiar, yeah. Right, good. So for people who don't know, the Eisenhower matrix is based on just basically a four by four grid because everything in consulting has to be four by four, right? You sound smarter that way. Um, <laughs> of, of two things, looking at like urgency and importance. And basically the concept is if something's high importance and high urgency, you do it first. And if it's something's like, super urgent but not as important you do it next if super something super important less urgent then you don't do the things that are low importance and low urgency great and that's a very nice framework it's wonderful the problem is it doesn't help you to figure out what you should be doing in the first place meaning it doesn't help you to come up with even a list of what you should be prioritizing and deprioritizing and and the problem with it is it's it, it implies that every decision is is you could be looked at in terms of importance and, and urgency. And I don't really believe that that's the case. What I'd rather do is I'd rather say, we have a series of principles. Be surprised only about being surprised. Be pragmatic, be bold, be, you know, expand your options. Those, those very, be long-term focused. There's certain principles in decision-making that are really important. Apply those principles and, and you know, things like talking about like, how do you create your luck? Um, which I could talk about later if you want. Um, apply those principles and things will happen as opposed to like a rigid framework. Yep. Let's talk about the luck. Okay, sure. So a lot of times people, Sabir, have said to me, oh my God, David, you are so lucky. So I was just mentioning earlier to you that we just had Jewel on our podcast. Like how the heck did you get Jewel? Like the, you know, platinum award winning, Grammy award winning, you know, singer. So that was lucky. That was lucky. And how are you the CEO of Meetup? Lucky. How are you teaching Columbia? Lucky. Like so many things in my life have been lucky. People are like, you're so lucky. And I'm like, I am lucky, but you can create your own luck. So what do I mean by that? Luck is hard work. One of the principles in decision making that I talk a lot about and write about is the importance of trying to create options. Many decisions can close off options. And some decisions, like a trap door, and some decisions can open up options. Being on a podcast, having your own podcast, like you do, Sabir, that decision to have your own podcast has opened up tremendous options for you, has caused all these lucky things to end up happening to you because you decided to have a podcast. You could have decided to spend that time playing video games. Probably a lot fewer lucky things would end up happening. And when you think about optionality and you think about how do you create options for yourself, and what I do is I see tens, hundreds, thousands of different options that are happening out there. Writing a book sees lots of options. Then lucky things end up happening. Like I was mentioning earlier, we talked about Bali and um, like some CEO of a company in Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm in New York, having to have read the book and said, wow, this is so helpful. I'm going, I, could you? you know, come and lead a leadership workshop. That's lucky. That's crazy. Who the heck has that happen? But it's because I made the decision to write a book or because of the decision to have a podcast. Now, not going to write a book or have a podcast, but you could make the decision, go to a meetup event, right? And network and meet a whole bunch of different people. That opens up lots of options and those options result in lucky things happening. So I, I would say that, David, uh, I'll give you something new for you. Uh, right. I don't know if you've heard this before. But luck, people confuse it with with a word. They think it's a word. It's an, actually an acronym. Oh, luck is laboring under correct knowledge. Ooh, 
L-U-C-K. That's what you gluck is. is In everything you just described, the more you know, the more action you take, and the more action leads to another action. One door, you have heard that cliche, one door opens the other door, right? Uh, it's, it's that, you know, it, as long as you continuously do those kinds of things and what we discussed earlier, either you'll succeed or you learn something new, right? And, and there are entrepreneurs that have had tremendous, amazing failures in their lives. Their comeback story was hundred folds better. Yes. Yes. Compared to what they failed at, but they're, they're known as, oh, the XYZ failed at that thing. Yeah. Everybody celebrates Elon Musk. How many times has he has gotten to the brink of bankruptcy, whether his first rocket ship, he had his final amount of capital on him before he would send out his final test of SpaceX. After that, if it crashed, that's it. There was there would be yeah, no and, SpaceX. And Tesla, and Tesla, the same thing, was on the brink of bankruptcy as well. I so think it's it, L-U-C-K. Well, did you come up with the with the with the label? No, I think I the thing is a lot of stuff is in my head. I may have heard it. I don't want to take any credit for it. You yeah. know, I but, may but have I heard it like concept. 30 years ago, some somewhere or read it somewhere. But you Very could nice. you could go, I'm sure that you can Google it to give credit to the right person. It's not Beautiful. me though, but it Beautiful. it is labeling laboring under correct knowledge. You know, the more you become more lucky when you become more intelligent about the things that you have tried, the more you try the more lucky you'll get in, uh, in in eyes of the people. And many people, you know, that overnight success people talk about, for some of those Dallas. people, Warren Buffett took him 55 years. You know, it's a very <laughs> long night. Well said. And, you know, I think people don't understand how much work goes into getting lucky and, um, and how important it is when you're making a decision, because we're talking about decision making, to think about are you creating options or are you destroying options with, with this decision? And, you know, for example, you could choose a career. You could choose a career that creates many different future options for yourself. You go into consulting, you go into investment banking or whatever. Or you could choose a career that creates very few options for yourself. It's very, it's very close and there's not that many things you could do. Um, and thinking about that as part, that's why principles are so important. Thinking about that, and you can't capture that in a, you know, Eisenhower matrix of how are you creating options for yourself in this decision is kind of a very important principle. Yeah, that's actually you know, one, one thing that kind of you triggered a memory uh, in me. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, t talking about like the decisions you have made in life versus what you could have it's the robert frost uh, yes. poem basically the road not taken right yes uh, and i can tell you that like for example when i was a teenager you know i, I went to john bond high school that's that's in flushing right here mm -hmm. and i um uh, i didn't know anything ab about college because no i had a, i didn't have a north star i didn't have anybody right. in my family that had gone already to college right? Mm -hmm. That could advise me on, on what to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I was an A student. I was given uh, I, I was given full free ride to Cooper Union. Wow. And, and, my, and my math teacher pushed really hard for me to get in there. Wow. But I went like, if the school, I heard that you have to pay for school. So if they're giving me a free ride, how good is that school? Because I didn't know anything about Cooper oh, Union, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, I know that in your head, you go like, what an idiot, right? But it's not your so fault. Said, you had no idea. I didn't know anything about scholarships. I, I, the term scholarship had no meaning to me. I didn't know anything about it. You know, it had no meaning. So I go, I decide to go and, and I, I say, you know what? Queens College is right here. It's easy. It's a bus ride. I can walk even there. I don't have to even pay for anything. So I'm going to go. I'm going to I'm going to go work. And the money that I'm going to collect, I'm going to pay the college tuition fees. Right. And I did that. But I think that if I had taken that road, Robert Frost, thank you. Right. If I had taken that road of Cooper Union, I may have been a, a fabulous like a mathematics professor or physics professor. Right. Versus what I did was I went for computer science at Queens College and I learned about doing things on my own. Beautiful. Right. If I needed to go to college, I could pay for it and I can go get my degree and I can make those kind of decisions. I think it also instilled in me the sense of entrepreneurship too. Yes. Like consulting while I was going to school, right? Yeah. And I was getting paid. 
and, and on and on and on. I think it led to all of the decisions I've made from then on. One decision, one door, it just opened up another door. And things that pivoted and didn't work out, actually, I'm glad that they did not work out. Laid Beautiful. off from a job 20 years ago, perfect. What a great decision. What a blessing. I could not have met XYZ people. Yes. Could not have connected with Shark Tank and all of these other amazing other opportunities in my life that I've had. So I think that decision making and, and deciding is an important principle. Yes. Well right? said, Severe. Thank you. That's such a great example. I, I really love it. And it's amazing how how decisions that you make early in your career can have a profound impact, but nothing's irreversible. And you can, and you can make decisions when you're 50 or 60 years old that will change your life. Someone very close to me had just decided at close to 50 years old to start, um, you know, start getting a master's degree. And that's a decision. And that's a beautiful thing. It's never too late. How many students do you have? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I have students in my class. They are in their 50s and 60s right now. Yeah. It's, and it's finishing really up their BA degree. Wow. Beautiful. So my, my class is a graduate school class. Um, and we have students in their 20s, but we have people in their 30s and 40s getting a, a graduate degree from Columbia. And it's a beautiful thing. And they add so much. People who have been out of college for 10, 20 years, the life experiences that they have, the examples that they're able to bring, it's amazing. I mean, you know, business school, I went to Warden for business school. Business school, top business schools force you to be out for two, three, four years at a minimum. And there were very few people that went straight from college to business school. They just didn't get as much out of it. They didn't contribute as much. And the ability to have like a pause and a break between college and graduate school and to really grow during that time, experience things during that time, learn, learn during that time, it's just invaluable. How are you going to talk about 15 to 20 years of your practical experience because you had none? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. That's the thing. Exactly. I mean, if you've gone through two or three layoffs, you, there's plenty you, you have learned oh, yeah. from that process, hopefully, you know, or exactly. if you had, you were part of an amazing startup that grew to from zero to over a billion dollars. That's something that you can talk about, you know? Yeah, no, they, it's great. I mean, at all stages of life, if I may add. So I have, uh, I have three kids. Um, and, and all th two, two of the three have already graduated from high school and they do a gap year between high school and college. And I think you get more out of your college experience if you take a gap year in between high school and college and, and kind of have some kind of interesting life experience during that time. People oftentimes are too, too fast of a rush. They, they feel like they have to finish everything up on the right cadence and it shouldn't be that way. Taking a break between high school and college, taking a break between college and graduate school, taking a break from your job for three months for a period of time or whatever can be one of the best growth. One of the best growth experiences I had was when I was fired and I had three months to like figure out what I wanted to do because I had a nice severance. And um, it really helped me figure out like what I wanted to prioritize and what was important to me, which was, for me was working for a mission driven company where I felt like what we were doing was really making the world a better place. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that helped me a lot. We talked quite a lot about uh, short-term goals and short-term decision-making. Uh, do the principles uh, apply to like long-term and longer-term goals? Yeah, I think one of the things I always, I always tell people is understand, first of all, whether or not you tend to make decisions when you, by overweighting short-term or by overweighting longer-term. And, and understand which your inclination is. Are you more than overweight short-term or long-term? But from a long-term goal perspective, you know, here's an example. Oftentimes people are working in business and they do what's best for themselves. They should be doing what's best for the company. So I, for example, used to work at a company called Dwayne Reed, which I'm sure Sabir, you know, out of business school. It's <laughs> very a familiar. Pharmacy yeah. chain in the New York metro area. Yeah. And I was in charge of building out a new business for the company. I just graduated from, from business school. I was whatever, 28 years old. And I didn't do what was best for the company. I did what was just best for myself. Um, I focused on kind of, building this business up, even though it wasn't going very well and kept growing and growing, and growing, because it would be good for me. And like, that's, you know, maybe good in the short term, but bad in the long term. And ultimately I built something that just had no scalability. We're losing lots of money. The technology wasn't really working well. And, and they shut down the entire business. And that did not help me in the long term. I had to take like a step back actually in my career after that. Um, but, what I did is, 
is I learned from that. And I said, always focus on what is best for your company. Good things will happen. And it's an important principle as well, as opposed to just saying, I'm going to do what's ever best for myself. Like resume building is that that's the term I like use. Resume you know? building or, or taking a job for like a big brand, like I'm going to work for Google. Great, but that's just a short-term brand. And if your job at Google is something that's going to be exciting and you grow from it, great. But it may be better work for some no-name startup than to work for Google because you're going to learn and you grow more. You're going to expose to more opportunities. I, I turned down Boston Consulting Group. This is a great consulting firm. I turned down Deloitte Consulting another great consulting firm. And I got job offers from all these different places. And I worked for a no name place right out of college because I knew I would have a better experience and help me. I knew it would help me in the long term. So absolutely, you know, making sure that that you're long term oriented in your decision. It's a long career. It's a long life. Thank God. Um, very, very important part of decision making. Yeah. And, and plus, I think because um, I've, I've, I've made those kind of decisions myself, too. Um, when you are joining a no-name brand, right, you just have access to so much more opportunity to work on different type and types of things and solve different problems. You just have the opportunity to do that versus if you are Boston Consulting Group, right, or Grant Thornton or Ernst & Young, mm -hmm. the problem is you are one function. Yes. And you're, and you're in a set structure, which is yeah. can't break out of. And actually, one of, one of the things I advise, because my clients ask me this question, they say, um, oh, I have this incredible candidate. Uh, she was the uh, director or VP at Johnson & Johnson. Let's use right. that as an example, right? I said, okay, let's forget, uh, let's forget about the fact that they're from Johnson & Johnson. What have they done specifically? Right. right. Because the thing is, when you're, when you're at Johnson & Johnson, that person has 25 other people around them for one decision. Yes. tiny decision. Yes. They're not making it, you know? Yes. And, and working across functions is so important. Too many times in big companies, you're working in your little silo. I'm not saying big companies are bad. They're good and they're bad in certain ways. But it's important to get exposure outside of just a silo. Smaller companies tend to give you more of that exposure. Yeah. So for one final thought, what is, this is what the question I ask all of my guests. Great. What is your number one uh Thought or or the principle from the forty four, right? That's a hundred thousand dollar expert insight. You wanna you wanna you want our entrepreneurs and listeners to take away from them and implement it ASAP. Okay, here's what I would say. By the book. In in, in, <laughs> in the book, I talk about kind of decision zero, which is before you even start your job, your ability to succeed starts the moment that you accept a position. And there's many actions that you can take after you accept, before you start. You can meet with people prior to your start. You can um, read uh, a tremendous amount about your, about, you can ask for a lot of information and data prior to starting. So set yourself up for success in your new job, not on day one, but two weeks, three weeks before day one, and you will end up really hitting the ground running on your day one. And not enough people do that. Not enough people say, send me information. I want to talk to people beforehand. So when you make a decision, always think about what could you do? I, I decided to join this company. What could I do right now that could put me in a position to succeed and not wait until you actually start? That's a well put. I really like that advice. I actually do that with every client right now. Beautiful. As soon as they sign the contract, they go like, but we're not supposed to have a kickoff. I said... I know you, you know me, we said hello already. Send me all these things. When we do the kickoff, I'm going to I'm going to start telling you exactly what we need to do. Beautiful. We'll spend 30 seconds on saying hello and how was your weekend? Which is by and the way, you're gonna tell me. <laughs> which severe is like I also like to say is the most selfish thing you could do is to be unselfish. And that's an example of that. You're being unselfish. You're giving your time without getting paid for in the beginning, but being that unselfish person is actually one of the best things you could do for yourself. So be unselfish, help other people, great things will happen. Definitely. Uh, David, thank you for being here on the show and, and sharing your journey and, and your wisdom related to Decide and Conquer. Definitely, I would highly recommend uh, to my audience to pick up this book uh, from wherever books are sold, Amazon and what Barnes & Noble and everywhere else. Uh, uh, really appreciate you being here. I loved it. I loved it. Can't wait to uh, hear the episode and, and to connect further. Take care. 
Definitely. And uh, thank you, audience, for tuning in. Uh, whether you're caught it live or, or on the recording, we have amazing guests like David uh, coming on the show. This is our fourth season, uh, and we have uh, many, many amazing guests. Four years. <laughs> four years. I can't believe I'm doing this for four years now. But incredible guests, and they have shared their journey with us and, and their wisdom with us. I really appreciate each and every one of them. Thank you again, David. Absolutely. Okay.